Hi, I wanted to make this video for a friend who is becoming more and more convinced of pedo baptism. But like many of us who've made the transition from being a credo, believers only Baptist, credo Baptist, to a, a pedo, uh, an infant and adult believers Baptist, um, many of, like many of us who've made that transition, the kind of the final major hurdle that he uh, is having to deal with is Jeremiah 31. He's becoming convinced from the scripture, as I was, that uh, that pedo baptism is taught in the Bible. But Jeremiah 31 is a major sticking point. And um, we read it here, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. Of course, the new covenant. Um, is what Christ inaugurated in his death and his resurrection. Not like the covenant that I made with their fathers on the day when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. My covenant that they broke, though I was their husband, declares the Lord. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them, and I will write it on their heart. Okay, so here... We have regeneration within them, and I will write it on their heart, and I, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And no longer shall each one teach his neighbor and each his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity, and I will remember their sin no more. Okay, so he says the uh, major issue here is that they said that they shall all know me from the least of them to the greatest. And the assumption is that that is, uh, that's a reference of um, you know, personal saving knowledge, basically that they will have a personal relationship with God in Christ. And you know, that is a reasonable assumption although you might tweak that a little bit. We'll talk about that. Um, but the major, and uh, well, so the major assumption there is is that infants can't do that, which I think if you try to decide that based on the scriptures rather than your own reasoning, that you come to a different answer. Um, you would have to assume that they can know the Lord, but we're not going to get in that today. Um, the other assumption is that they will no longer, no longer shall each one teach his neighbor and each his brother, saying, "Know the Lord." Okay, um, and and the assumption there is that this is this is talking about personal evangelism, okay, which we don't really see in the pages of the Old Testament, but we're told that you know that was we're we're kind of led to in, interpret this. Uh, based on our own understanding, modern understanding, you know, you know, talking to your neighbor about Christ, um, the assumption is that this is the same sort of thing, which I think is a pretty big assumption since we don't see that in the Old Testament. Um, then it says, "For I will forgive their iniquity, and I will remember their sin no more." So they'll be forgiven. Now, I'll open a new page here. Okay, so. The views, here's basically the, the Baptist view of uh, what has become different from the Old Covenant to the New Covenant. Okay, in the Old Covenant, we have Israel, which is the covenant people of God. Okay, and that includes a lot of adults, a lot of infants, um, and within Israel, there's a faithful remnant. Okay. And kind of the un underlying assumption is that the faithful remnant, you know, I've never really heard anybody say this, but it's definitely the assumption, is that the faithful remnant would be made up of adults who are faithful to Yahweh um, and not their children. Okay, so it's basically saying that these people knew the Lord, but their children didn't. 
again, I think that would be kind of weird for Old Testament saints to say, but we're not going to deal with that right at the moment. With the New Covenant, okay, we have, again, you have a lot of people. You have adults and their children. Um, and, um, you know, a lot of these people might go to church, okay. Um, we could say that, you know, here's here are people who are associated, I sure hope I spelled that right, with the church, but they would say that only this small piece right here is the church or the new Israel, okay? So in the old covenant, you had a faithful remnant, um, and they were just a part of Israel, okay? But in the new covenant, we have the new Israel, okay? And we have the church, okay? And that is entirely made up of regenerate people. And, you know, people that, you know, basically we can tell they're regenerate. They're giving us, showing us signs of that, okay? Now, here's the problem with this, okay? Basically, when God says, okay, everybody in this new covenant is going to know me, what the um, the the Baptist takes this label here, kind of of the covenant people of God, and instead of this inner circle of people who know God being expanded to fill the whole thing, they say that God kind of relabels and says, you know, in the New Covenant, it's just this central group that are my people, okay? So you see what, what what's happened here, okay? In the old, there was this faithful remnant, which was a problem. You want the whole people of God to know God. And what you would assume would happen would, that, would be that God would make this faith, make this entire people faithful like the faithful remnant. You would expect that. But the Baptist is saying, no, okay, this label of, of you know, covenant people, which is given to Israel, is applied only to this group right here, okay? And so the label is just given to the more narrow group, okay? Now, of course, there is greater efficacy. I know that nobody would deny that, um, but, you know, God has fulfilled his promise, it would seem, by switching around some labels and saying that, you know, this um, this smaller group is, um, is the only one who are really God's people in the New Covenant. Now, the problem with that is that there are a lot of passages where the God promises for the New Covenant blessings for the offspring of his people. Actually, you know, related to the salvation regeneration of his people. Uh, Deuteronomy 36 is probably the strongest of these. It says, the Lord your God will circumcise your heart and the heart of your offspring so that you will love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. Um, and I cut it off there. Isaiah 44, 3 talks about, I'll pour my spirit upon your offspring. Um, I think I cut one off there. I don't think that was one of them. Isaiah fifty nine twenty one says, "My spirit that is upon you, and my words um, uh, shall not depart out of your mouth, or out of the mouth of your offspring." So the spirit, you know, God's putting His spirit upon His people, and that spirit will not leave. And then lastly, God says he won't bear, that they won't bear children for calamity. So you have this huge problem. You see, children, bearing children for calamity. You might have a faithful uh, mother and father. You might have someone like Samuel, who's faithful to God, faithful remnant. And then his kids grow up to be um, terrible, faithless, godless people. And you don't want to 
you know, bear these children. We've got these promises for our children. We don't want them to grow up, reject the Lord, and basically um, end up part of his, you know, deserving his wrath. Well, suffering his wrath, say that. We all deserve his wrath. Um, and so this is, you know, God has promised that he's going to change the heart of the offspring. And so let's imagine this, that there was a mayor of a town and he runs for election and let's say that there's a big homelessness problem within the town and he says if i'm elected then there will be then every person in this town will have a house to live in okay he says that every person in this house will have a house to live in or in this town will have a house to live in he's making these promises over and over and he says Getting closer to the election, he says, you know, he says, no longer will anyone say about this town that we have a homeless problem because everyone in this ha town will have a house, okay? Now, um, let's imagine that when he's elected on this platform, that this mayor, okay, let's, let's say here's the town, here's the population of the town, and... Let's say that here, let's say, I mean, this is, here are the people who actually have a home, okay? And once he is elected, now the assumption is when he says that everyone will have a place to live, the assumption is that he's going to somehow provide houses or some sort of housing assistance uh, for those people who are homeless which would be, I'll highlight them in green right here, which would be this kind of outside ring of people who don't fit in that category, okay? And so he gets elected, and you would expect him to make this inner ring grow bigger so that everyone has a house. But instead, what the mayor does is he um, hires Greyhound or somebody like that to start picking up homeless people and taking them to Detroit and letting them live there. So has he kept his campaign promise? Well, technically, he's kept his promise because he has made sure that every single person within the town has a house to live in. Okay. Um, he's made sure that there's no more homelessness within the city. Um, but in another very real sense, he hasn't kept his promise because you would have assumed that he's helping out these people that need help when in reality um, he's just kind of saying instead of uh, he is kind of cutting these other people off from the the group known as, we'll say, the town. Okay, The town used to include homeless people. Now to make it 100% non-homeless, uh, he has removed those people so that the town is just those people who already had a home. Okay, That's kind of the, the parallel I would give it, this, the Baptist interpretation. Uh, when you read Jeremiah 31, is God saying that, um, that he is going to kind of relabel the people of God so that only the faithful remnant will be called, you know, my people. Is that what God's planning on doing? Is that what the other verses sound like he's going to do? Or is God planning on expanding that inner circle so that it includes everybody? Okay? So what, what I'm going to argue is that this is not what God is saying from these verses. And if we look at where uh, Jeremiah 31 is used in the New Testament, we get a good clue here. Uh, if we turn to Hebrews 8, that's where Jeremiah 31 is quoted in the New Testament, and we get the context. We have a kind of we have this inspired commentary on Jeremiah 31. He says uh, he's talking about the priesthood. He says that we have such a high priest who is seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in heaven, a minister of the holy places, in the true tent that the Lord set up, not man. 
For every high priest is appointed to offer gifts and sacrifices. Thus it is necessary for, for this priest also to have something to offer. Now, if he were on earth, he would not be a priest at all, since there are priests who offer gifts according to the law. So we have these priests according to the law, according to the old covenant, which is what Jeremiah kind of contrasts in that passage. They serve a copy and a shadow of the heavenly thing. For when Moses was about to erect the tent, he was instructed by God, saying, See that you make everything according to the pattern that, you, that was shown you on the mountain. But as it is, Christ has obtained a ministry that is as much more excellent than the old as the covenant he mediates is better since it is enacted on better promises for if the first covenant had been faultless there would have been no occasion to look for a second okay and then he he quotes this passage that we've looked at and he says in speaking of a new covenant he makes the first one obsolete and what is becoming obsolete and growing old is ready to vanish okay um, ending the old covenant system in 70 AD. Now, even the first covenant had regulations for worship in an earthly place of holiness. Okay, and so we have we, we he starts out talking about the priesthood, um, and then he kind of backs up what he's saying with Jeremiah 31, and then he's back into the talk of the priesthood after the quote, and so the in what you would expect is that uh, Jeremiah 31 is also about the priesthood. Okay? It's also about the system of worship. Okay. Now what I would argue is what's going on in between the old, old covenant and the new covenant is that in the old covenant we have, let's say we have We have a high priest, and he, the high priest, is part of the priesthood. Okay, that's what this circle is right here, the priesthood. Um, and then, I'll get another color just to try to make this a little clearer. Then we have the Levites. Okay, now... The Levites, and then we have just kind of the common everyday. Oops, I didn't mean to pick the same color. We have the common everyday Israelites. Okay, didn't work real well. So here's the Israelites, and then outside of them, we have. The world. We have an entire hierarchy here. This will be the world. And the, um, the worship system of the Old Covenant, which is what the writer of Hebrews is talking about, allowed access to God, uh, not as far as his heavenly temple went, but as far as his, his dwelling in an earthly temple. Okay? Um, there was access to God. Not the sort of access we enjoy in the New Covenant. But there was an a earthly system of access. And the high priest was the only one that got to go into the most holy place. Okay, so here he is. Here he is. He's very special. And um, he got to go places that the priesthood could not go. But then uh, the Levites couldn't go where the priesthood could go. And then the Israelites couldn't go where the Levites could go. And if you were part of the world, if you were a Gentile, this outer circle, then you couldn't go to any of those places. So you had, and then you, you, know, you can get into to various aspects here of cleanliness laws and everything. And um, But you have kind of a, at a basic level, uh, one, two, three, four, four levels of, you know, kind of special access to God, okay? And, and all what each of these is doing is being a priest to those in the outer ring. So the high priest is a priest to the priesthood and everybody else. 
the priesthood is a priest to the Levites. Um, Israel is a priest to the world. And so everyone is teaching their neighbor to know the Lord. Everyone is offering access. And the Levites, especially, who are dispersed throughout the land, will have that job. The New Covenant, then, okay, is different. We have an actual heavenly sanctuary, okay, and we have this high priest who is Jesus Christ. And if you're in Jesus, then you have full access to God. If you have Jesus is God, if you're in Jesus, you have full access to this heavenly sanctuary. And there is still, we're still priests to the world, that's what Peter tells us. Still priests to the world. But anybody in the world can be made alive and come in and have access through Jesus. It's very free, okay? Uh, because of what Jesus did, because he died and rose again. And so that's the difference, I believe, that Hebrews 8 is talking about, okay? um, is that we have one ring of separation, and, is, and that is anyone who's in Christ has access to God. And that's the big difference. Now, here's the deal, though. Within the Old Covenant, you had, um, to become an Israelite, you had to be circumcised. So I'll draw some scissors here. You had to be circumcised. Um, there were special washings to become a Levite. Well, to become a priest, okay, if, if you were um, of the descendants of Aaron, okay, there were certain washings that you had to go through to get into that inner circle. If you're, you know, not in, if you're an Israelite, not only being circumcised but washed. Also, there were washings for just everyday Israelites to be able to maintain access to God. Okay. So we have we have the cutting that makes you a certain level priest and we have as far as making you an Israelite, then you have the washing which makes you a priest if you're of that line. What's interesting here and what people fail to understand is that John the Baptist was the son of a high priest. And so they say, where did baptism come from? And, you know, they just talk about the Qumran community and all this nutty stuff. When he's the son of a high priest, and he knew all about washing, okay? okay. What, what happens in the New Covenant is that God takes this whole system of cutting and washing and all that, and he makes one single sign. And so when you enter into Jesus, okay, you're automatically a high priest. Okay, you're automatically a priest. There, um, there's not like, you know, you can be an Israelite, a part of the people of God, but not be a priest to God. Because just the simple act of entrance into the Christian community makes you a priest gives you access to God. Um, say at least that is when it's accompanied by the Spirit, by the work of the Spirit and made effectual through faith. Uh, but Colossians 2, 11 through 15, it says, In him you were circumcised with a circumcision made without hands uh, by putting off the body of the flesh. And I believe that's the death of Christ. And you see that language in Paul. Uh, well, in Romans, of course, it's Paul, by the circumcision of Christ. And he says, okay, when did this happen? When was I circumcised? When was I, when was I put to death in the body? Okay, that's the circumcision of Christ, his death on the cross. When was I circumcised in that way without hands? He says, having been buried with him in baptism. Okay? And so we see here that in baptism... We are killed with Christ, basically. Okay? And so there's this connection to Christ and that we have through baptism. 
and I would say even the infants do, which is what God's promising, that he's going to circumcise the heart of the, of the offspring of his people. They've got this connection to Christ, and we know that when it's accompanied by faith, that that is effectual. It says you're raised through faith. When that's accompanied by faith, well, the result is, is that you were raised with Christ, also given new life, okay? And so we can say then that the heart of an infant is circumcised in its baptism, and um, if the Spirit is working, then that child is also, as he grows in his or her faith in God, starting at the smallest level of trust and moving up in knowledge, that child is being raised from the dead with Christ. Okay, so they've got that connection. They've got that circumcision in heart. And so they have access to God. And so that is the what I see as the contrast that's going on in Jeremiah 31. Thank you for uh, listening to this entire message.